Tuesday is going to be St. Patrick's Day. Not just in Boston, but in the rest of the country as well. Not just in Chicago. You know, the joke growing up in Chicago was that they would dye the uh, Chicago River green for St. Patrick's Day. It is. And so the question that that we uh, asked Mary Daly one day was, If we could dye the Chicago River green for St. Patrick's Day, why can't we dye it blue the rest of the year? (laughs) To which he replied, if you knew how many millions of dollars we spent dyeing it green one day a year, you would know why we don't dye it blue the rest of the year. (laughs) But it'll even be St. Patrick's Day here on the Eastern Shore on Tuesday, although I doubt anything's going to happen. Do you realize that Ireland, Ireland canceled all St. Patrick's Day? Celebrations nationwide because of the coronavirus. And uh, I don't know why that would be a thing to them. They don't even drink that kind of beer in, in Ireland, that Mexican, you know, beer. They don't even drink that there. They, they drink real beer in Ireland, so, you know. But some of y'all got that joke. Maybe you're Baptist, so you just don't have the capacity to appreciate a good beer joke. I don't know. If you were Lutherans now, you'd you'd have that capacity. Amen. But for whatever reason, Baptists are often afraid to celebrate St. Patrick's Day or to get involved in the St. Patrick's Day festivities. And and I don't know why that is. Maybe they're afraid, you know, they they feel guilty because they're, you know, they feel like it's a Catholic holiday or something. But Patrick, the truth of history is, was a Baptist. The Catholics stole Patrick from us. Patrick was really a Baptist. 
The Catholics stole his legacy, they stole his history, they stole his story, but he's really one of us. And so this morning I'm going to preach a message titled, St. Patrick was a Baptist. And I struggled not with the content of the message, but what my text should be this morning. And the reason I chose 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 was because toward the end of his life, Patrick had written that One of the things that motivated him to go to Ireland as a missionary was reading the end of 1 Thessalonians. And so this morning I decided to take 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 as my text. And we'll start in verse 1. The Bible says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety... Then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But she, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober." putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. So that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesying, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it, brethren, Pray for us. Greet all the brethren with an holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. Grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And so Patrick, in commenting on these verses, he said this. He said, the time is short. The situation is dire. The coming of the Lord is imminent. And the power of God is available. And so with that, Patrick went to Ireland, and he literally won a nation to Christ. And so that's what I'd like to preach about this morning, because as we look at the life of Patrick, we find probably one of the greatest heroes of the faith that ever lived. In the life of Patrick, we find one of the greatest missionaries that ever was, one of the greatest preachers of the gospel, one of the greatest soul winners. But not only that, as we look at the life of Patrick, we have a great opportunity to be introduced to primitive Christianity, to the Christianity of our forefathers. Not this so-called Christianity that we have today, or even the Christianity that evolved out of whatever churches were doing in the Middle Ages, but the original faith of our fathers. It's a faith that dates back to just a couple of hundred years after Christ was crucified. Because we don't normally think about it, but Patrick preached in the 300s. Back in the 300s, Christianity, if you will, church, if you will, was a lot purer because it was a lot closer to the apostles and even to the Lord himself. And so the churches in Patrick's day were a lot more New Testament in their faith. The practice of their faith, it didn't have millennia for the traditions and the junk to accumulate. And so their faith was much closer to that which the Lord and the apostles had preached. Not only that, as we look at the Christianity of Patrick's day, we see the Christianity of our own race and our own blood, the faith of our forefathers, if you will, 
As we look at the primitive churches of Great Britain and Ireland, if there's any English blood that flows through your veins this morning, any Scottish blood, any Irish blood, you'll learn of the faith in the churches of your forefathers. And so this morning I want to preach that St. Patrick was a Baptist. You know, when you say something like that, it startles people. In fact, one day I was at the post office and I introduced myself and I told the person I was talking to, I said, you know, I'm thinking of preaching Sunday on St. Patrick was a Baptist. There was an old black man and he asked, he says, so St. Patrick was a Baptist. How did you figure that out? And so I spent about 90 seconds and I explained it to him. And he just looked at me and said, well, preacher, I hope you make a lot of people mad Sunday. (laughs) But do you want to know why that revelation is so startling when I say something like St. Patrick was a Baptist? It's because there's a theory and that theory, it's been proven true so many times that if you say something and then you say something and you say something, And you say something, eventually people are going to believe it. They just stop questioning it. They take it for granted. And however many eons ago, the Catholic Church laid claim to Patrick and they told a lie and they told a lie and they told a lie. And now 100 and 200 and 300 and 400 and 500 and however many hundred years later, everybody just assumes, well, he was a Catholic. But what really happened was the Catholic Church went back into antiquity and they found somebody and they said, you know, this is the guy we wish all our priests would have been. And they declared him to be a saint. And now everybody just assumes he was a Catholic, but he was really a Baptist. It was the year 430 AD and that was long after Patrick was dead. Pope Celestine I sent an emissary to Ireland. His name was Palladius. And Palladius' job was to encourage all of the churches of Ireland, most of whom were, you know, started by Patrick, to join with Roman Catholicism. But Palladius failed miserably at that task. In fact, Palladius failed so miserably that after a brief visit, he left Ireland in disgust and he never went back again. And it would not be until the 12th century, hundreds of years later, that another emissary would go to Ireland and and Catholicism would even get a toehold in Ireland. But the traditional story of Patrick, as has been told by the Catholics, is actually the story of Palladius. And what they did was they added the name of Patrick to Palladius and they tell the story of Palladius going to Ireland. And then they tell the two stories as one. And they just leave out that big long gap between when Patrick died and when Palladius came or that Palladius came after Patrick and all that. And so they have this story where Patrick went to Ireland by order of the Pope and converted all the Celts to Roman Catholicism and established Catholicism in Ireland. But it didn't happen that way at all because Patrick got to Ireland long before the Catholics did. And the historical record shows that Patrick was a Baptist. You see, you've got to understand, the first biography of Patrick was written in the 7th century, and so that was 400 years after Patrick died. And Patrick wrote of himself in his own writings, and his own writings tell a different story than the books that were written about him 400 years after he died. For example, I'll give you an illustration of this. For 18 years... I have been struggling and struggling and struggling and struggling to write a book on Jesse James. I wrote a book, 17 chapter book on Robert E. Lee. Easy. I totally ignored Lee's military career, wrote entirely on Lee the Christian. And people would ask me, why did you ignore Lee's military career? And that's really simple because there were thousands of books on Lee the soldier. I wanted to write the book nobody had written. So I wrote on Lee the Christian. But it was an easy book to write because all of the material was there and the material was cut and dry. I just had to compile it and put it in a book. Jesse James, on the other hand, is different. You say, well, what makes Jesse James so difficult to write about? There's just so much legend. Jesse, I don't know if you realize this or not, but more books have been written about Jesse James than any other human being that's ever walked the face of the earth except Jesus. And about 30 years ago, there were some who were thinking that the number of books about Jesse may surpass Jesus. 
didn't happen, but it almost did. That's how close the race became. But there's a lot of books on Jesse James. But you look back, and how do you differentiate between the true accounts of Jesse James and the legends in the dime store novels? It's hard to do. And that was the same with Patrick. They started writing about Patrick in the 700s, the 800s, the 900s, and a lot of legends had crept in there. For example, one of the legends is that Patrick miraculously led all of Ireland. He led all the snakes out of Ireland. He rid Ireland completely of snakes. We all know the story of the Pied Piper. He let all the mice out. Well, this is the same similar story. Patrick was like a, a divine Pied Piper who led snakes out. But there was a Latin writer. His name was Selenius, and he had written 100 years before Patrick, and he had already documented that Ireland did not have reptiles. So Ireland had no snakes. Ireland had no lizards. Ireland had no geckos. You know, when Terry and I lived in Florida, we loved geckos. Or geckos. Yeah. Especially when it came time to buy car insurance. But Irish people can't save money on, on car insurance because they don't have any smooth-talking reptiles to save them money. So, you know, they just, they got to pay full price. But in the Caribbean, there are islands with no snakes. Hawaii has no snakes. And so Patrick did not rid Ireland of snakes. Ireland just never had snakes to begin with. But anyways, fast forward to the 17th century. It's the 1600s. James I is king of England. Then Charles I becomes king. Then Oliver Cromwell raises an army. They call it the Protestant Uprising. Cromwell will have Charles I beheaded. And then Cromwell will refuse the throne and he'll call himself Lord Protector of England. And for the next seven years, England will have no king but Jesus. And actually, England would be a democracy under Cromwell for seven years, and Parliament hated that. And so when Cromwell dies, they pull Charles II out of exile in France, and they reestablish the monarchy. But during those years, there was a great scholar in England, and his name was James Usher. And he may have been the most scholarly man of all time, perhaps, I don't know. But when the King James Bible was translated from 1604 to 1611, James Usher was one of the great scholars who translated the Bible. And one of the reasons that we use the King James and don't use the others is because the King James Bible was translated by great men like James Usher, great scholarly minds. And when you compare the modern day scholars to the scholarship of Usher, Usher was an intellectual giant and the modern day scholars are just intellectual pygmies by comparison. Usher he had organized the chronology of the Bible. In other words, he put all the Bible passages in chronological order. And they called it Usher's Chronology. I don't know if you've heard of it or not. The early editions of the King James Bible contain Usher's Chronology. You can go to the bookstore today. You can buy Usher's Chronology. If you own a chronological Bible, chances are it was arranged by Usher's Chronology. And... Usher was such a great scholar that King James made him the primate or the leader of all the churches in Ireland. And then Charles I bestowed even higher honors on him. And then Cromwell came to power and everybody thought, well, you know, Cromwell's executed Charles I. He's pretty much executing everybody in the church that was appointed by Charles I. Because the reason Cromwell raised the revolution was not because he thought Charles I was a bad king politically, Cromwell and his fellow Puritans believed Charles was bad for the churches, and so they got rid of Charles not to save the government, but in their mind to save the faith. And so everybody said, well, you know, James Usher is the leader of the British churches by order of Charles I, so Cromwell's going to get rid of him. He's going to be the next person to die in this thing. But to everybody's surprise, Cromwell also honored Usher. I mean, so much so that when Usher died, some say Cromwell gave him the most elaborate state funeral Westminster Abbey had ever seen. But Usher was Irish, and he was born in Ireland. And in the early years of Usher's ministry, King James had encouraged him to research the Irish churches when he became the primate of all the churches of Ireland. And so this great scholar, James Usher, he does this exhaustive study of the churches, their history. He does an exhaustive study of Patrick. And he credits Patrick with having been the person who basically brought Christianity to Ireland. 
And in the 17th century, at a time when the Church of England was aggressively persecuting Baptists, James Usher proclaims the great truth. He says Patrick was a Baptist. And he said that Patrick was simple yet humble. He was dynamic and zealous. He was a preacher of the gospel. And James Usher declared him to be a Baptist missionary that God used to convert the Irish people from paganism to Christianity. And so again, you say, well, then why do most people think Patrick was a Baptist? Because they heard the story, they heard the story, they heard the story, they believed the story. But Patrick had written extensively, especially at the end of his life. He wrote what was called the Confessions of Patrick, and he wrote it in his old age. For whatever reason, at the end of his life, there was someone uh, in France, they called it Gaul back then, who had dared to accuse Patrick to say he was unqualified to be a missionary. And he said that the churches that Patrick had planted in Ireland were illegitimate. And so Patrick wrote a defense of his life and his work and his ministry and of the Irish churches. And then there was a British general named Caroticus, and he conquered all of Wales for the British. And Caroticus, at one time, at the end of Patrick's ministry, had come in and ravaged the entire Irish seacoast. And he slaughtered many of the converts of Patrick. In one instance, they were literally dressed in their white robes waiting to be baptized. And Caroticus and the army just came in and slaughtered half of them. The other half, they took off to sell the slavery. And Patrick sent letters to Caroticus asking for the return of his converts and of his people. And Caroticus just scoffed at him. But Patrick's correspondence with Caroticus is still available. And Patrick's writings tell a lot about him. They tell what kind of preacher he was, the kind of churches he established. And if you look at the early British churches, the ones that sent Patrick to Ireland, you look at the churches of Great Britain, and you'll see that Patrick was a Baptist like we were. Patrick was born in 360 A.D., He was born at the mouth of the Clyde River, about 14 miles from Glasgow, so that's what we now call Scotland. And he was born in a town called Dumbarton, and his father was a man named Calpurnius, who was the deacon in the Baptist church and the magistrate of Dumbarton. And his grandfather was the pastor of the Baptist church. And so... His dad and his grandfather were both married, so if that was a Catholic church that Patrick had come up in, obviously that wouldn't have been the case. But these early churches in Great Britain, Britain was invaded by the Romans, by Julius Caesar himself in 50 AD. That was just 17 years after the crucifixion of Christ. And so when the Roman legions crossed the English Channel into what we now call Great Britain, they found a group called the Belgic Celts. They call them Britons. And then a little further in, they found another Celtic tribe called the Caledonians, who were the modern day Irish. And the Romans call these Irish pigs because they painted their bodies. I don't know if you've ever watched a Packer game on television, how they paint their bodies one color on one side and one color on the other side. Well, that's what these uh, Caledonians or these Irish did. And the Romans could subjugate the Belgic Celts. In other words, they could subjugate the Britons. They could conquer England, but they couldn't conquer Ireland. The Irish were just too savage. And so the the Romans built a wall, and they walled off Ireland from Great Britain. Donald Trump wants to build a wall. That's what the Romans did. They built a wall because they could not conquer Ireland. They could conquer Scotland. They could conquer England, but they could not conquer Ireland. But this was just 17 years after Jesus died and rose again. This is just 17 years after the ascension of Christ. The Romans cross the English Channel. They get into Britain and guess what they find? A Christian nation. They didn't just find a few Christians. They didn't just find a few churches. They literally found a Christian nation. 17 years after the crucifixion of Christ... Christianity had conquered England before the Romans did. And so you say, well, well, 
how did that happen? I mean, obviously, there were great evangelists, there were great missionaries that had led England to Christ. And historians can only speculate. But there were seafaring people back then. And no doubt there were people who came from places like Philippi and Ephesus and Corinth and traded in the British Isles. And so, no doubt, these converts of the Apostle Paul or perhaps one of the other apostles had come to England just 17 years after Christ had died. And so they preached a very pure gospel. And they preached it with power, and England was conquered by the gospel before the Romans had conquered the island. And so these churches, like the one Patrick would have grown up in, they were very loyal to the Word of God. They had no authority except for the Bible. They had no denominational structure, no hierarchy. In other words, each church was independent. Each church was autonomous. Each church had its own pastor. They were like our churches. They were Baptist churches. And so long after Patrick was dead, there was a deputation sent from the papal court. We talked about Palladius. And they wanted to get the British churches into the Catholic Church. They wanted to get the Irish churches into the Catholic Church. And the British churches and the Irish churches rejected the Pope and they rejected his offer. And the reason they did was because they did not like all the pomp and pomposity of Rome. They didn't like the costumes that the emissaries wore. They didn't like all the ceremony because the British and the Irish form of church was very primitive. And it was very independent. They didn't report to anybody else outside of themselves. And they just wanted to keep doing things the way they had always done them. They didn't want to change. But these British and Irish churches, they were Baptist churches. They they were even described as such by this Catholic emissary. He called them Anabaptists. And so you say, well, then how did, he, how did Catholicism finally take a hold of England? Well, I'll tell you very briefly. In 423 AD, when the British and the Irish did not want to become part of Catholicism, the Pope convinced the Roman army to leave England. And when that happened, the Anglo-Saxons came and invaded, and the British no longer had the capacity to fight. Because the Roman army had occupied them for 300 years. They hadn't had to fight for 300 years. And so without the Roman army there to defend them, they didn't know what to do. But anyways, let's go back 200 years. And Patrick is born in this little town of Dumbarton. And his father's a deacon. His dad's, his grandfather's a pastor. He's taught the Bible. In his own confessions, he says he was taught the Bible, but he loved pleasure instead. He says he was warned of his need of salvation, but he did not heed the warning. He said he was taught the commandments of God by his father and his grandfather, but he failed to keep them. He said he knew that he needed to be saved, but he turned aside from the preaching of his grandfather and the example of his father. And then when he was 16, there was a pirate raid because I said the the Romans had built that big wall. The wall didn't work. The Irish couldn't scale the wall, but they could sail around it. And that's what they would do. They would sail around it. And then they would have these pirate raids. And there was this one particular night when Patrick was rounded up. He lived in a coastal town. He was rounded up in a pirate raid. He was taken to Ireland. And he was put into slavery as the slave of this tribal chieftain named Muley. And for the next seven years, he lived in a pig pen. And he fed Muley's hogs. And he said that he lived in hunger and dirt and filth. And he said that he was like a stone that was stuck in the mud. But at some point during that time as a slave in Ireland, Patrick got saved. And then one night he had a dream. And in this dream, he saw a ship. And so having been in Ireland now for several years, he had learned the Gaelic language and he had learned the Irish culture. And so he sneaks away in the middle of the night. And he goes to one of these boats and he knows the language and he knows how to conduct himself. And so they think he's one of the pirates and so they let him on the boat. And so when all the pirates get off to do the pirate raid, he just goes home. 
And he makes it home and his family is glad to see him and his church accepts him and his church accepts his profession of faith and he's baptized. And he's describing to his church the way Ireland is set up governmentally and culturally. And he explains the Druid religion to them and he asks that they start praying for Ireland and the church begins to pray for Ireland. And then one day God calls Patrick to go back to Ireland as a missionary. And Patrick tells his church in Britain, he says, Ireland has four kingdoms. He says, and out of, the, out of those four kingdoms, a fifth kingdom arose and is called the king, kingdom of Meath. He said, and the king of Meath became basically the king over the other four kings of Ireland. And so he's like the big king now. And he says that then under the, under the king of Meath, you have four tribal kings. And then under them, you have uh, tribal chieftains. And then under the chieftains, you have clan leaders. And he told him, he said, that the Irish kings are elected for their fierceness. Their fierceness as warriors. They don't, they're not born into being kings. They're elected to be kings by how fierce they are. He said in this Druid religion that they worship in, he said the priests are elected for their fierceness. He said, and the priests, they could literally point at somebody and say, hey, kill that person. And they're just killed. He said, the priests have more power even than the kings. But Patrick said this. He said, if I could go to Ireland, he said, if I could win the king of Meath to Christ. He said, the rest of the country will convert. And his church in Britain said, OK. OK. And they ordained him. And he enrolled in a Bible college that the church had. And he went there for the next couple of years. And then on his 30th birthday, they sent him back to Ireland as a missionary. And as soon as he gets off the boat, the first thing he starts doing is preaching the gospel to the people on the shore. And the Druid priests immediately order he be killed. But the people that they send to kill him are frozen and they can't kill him. They're just standing there frozen, immobile. And so Patrick continues to preach and the high priest of the Druid religion is led to Christ that day. And so then Patrick asked him, he says, well, I want to talk to the king of Meath. And he's like, well, I can't get you in to see the king of Meath right now. He's like, but I can I can get you over here. I can get you over here and you can preach to these tribal chieftains. And so Patrick goes and he preaches to the tribal chieftains and they get saved. And a man named Daiku gets saved and he's converted to Christ and he's baptized by Patrick. And Patrick plants the first church there at Daiku's palace and he'll be buried there 50 years later. But then uh, word comes to Daiku and he's invited to meet to a banquet at the king's palace. And so he takes Patrick with him and Patrick walks into the middle of this banquet hall that's 759 foot long and 90 foot wide. It's got 14 entrances and Patrick just jumps up on the middle of a table in that thing and just starts to preach. And the lawyers and the nobles who were assembled at the banquet tables come under conviction and they begin to be saved. And then by the end of the evening, the king of Meath had trusted Christ as a savior and they're all baptized by Patrick. And then that trickle down effect begins. And the other four kings are saved and the chieftains are all saved and the clansmen all are saved. And Patrick baptizes thousands and he plants 300 churches in Ireland and he sets them all up just like the church that he came of. They were in independent churches. They were self-governing churches. Each had their own pastor, each baptized by immersion, each believed the Bible was the word of God. In fact, Patrick, in his writings, didn't appeal to any outside sources. He only quoted the scripture itself. Patrick quotes the Old Testament 16 times from 18 different books. He quotes the New Testament 161 times from 22 books. In other words, Patrick had almost an entire Bible at his disposal. And in the 300s, that was unheard of. The Catholic priests certainly did not have entire Bibles at their disposal. And yet Patrick goes to Ireland with almost, if not the entire Bible with him. And he preaches the Bible and he organizes churches. 
And when Patrick dies, there are over 700 churches and 700 pastors in Ireland. And the amazing thing about that is only 200,000 people lived in Ireland back then. But Patrick, he preached a basic gospel. It was Acts 20, 21, repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Patrick preached the same gospel that we preach. And he built his churches near wells so they could fill big baptistries so that he could baptize his people just like we do. Patrick observed the Lord's Supper as a memorial ordinance just like we do. Patrick sent missionaries to the Britons and the Anglo-Saxons and the Gauls. And not only did he win Ireland, but he won much of Western Europe. And so you say, well, what happened to all those churches? Well, in 795 AD, the Danes invaded and the Scandinavians slaughtered everybody. J.M. Carroll, the historian, would call their story the trail of blood. But Patrick was a Baptist. He preached the same gospel that we did. He preached from the same Bible. He preached the same way of salvation. He organized churches just like ours. The Romans couldn't conquer Ireland, but the gospel did under Patrick's preaching. And so Patrick's in heaven now. But the same gospel that Patrick preached to transform Ireland will transform our lives if we'll let it. 1 John 5.13 says, These things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And so if you're here this morning and you'd like to know how to have eternal life, if you'd like to know more of that gospel that Patrick preached, just ask. 